uh, one of the big uh, goals here is to uh, use those pre follicles as a source for assisted reproduction. So instead of when we look at hosting cows, for example, at, at aspirating, let's say, eight to ten antral follicles for OPU, you could be taking an ovarian biopsy and getting hundreds of follicles, pre antral follicles, because there's more of those. But you need a way to grow them in the lab. And so that's one of the things that we do. And alongside that, we do uh, look at environmental factors. And a big one that we have looked at over the years is heat stress, because we know the effects of heat stress can be really catastrophic to reproduction. All right. Welcome to this edition of Dairy Black Belt Podcast. I'm Craig McConnell. I am the Director of Veterinary Veterinary Medicine Extension and Continuing Education at Washington State University. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anna Dinical, uh, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Her research is focused on reproductive and developmental biology with an ultimate goal of improving reproductive success and assisted reproductive technologies to benefit, benefit animal agriculture, wildlife conservation, and human health. A broad swath. So today we're going to chat about effects of heat stress on ovarian folliculogenesis and genetic selection of cattle for thermotolerance. So welcome, Dr. Dina Call. And first of all, am I saying your last name correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so first question. Can you briefly go over different stages of ovarian folliculogenesis in cows just to sort of lay the groundwork of what we're talking about? Sure, sure. Um, and thank you for that question. So um, when we think about folliculogenesis and when we, especially when we're doing cow work, right, we're doing ultrasounds and looking at the ovaries and trying to figure out what stage of the, the cycle they are and so on, we look at the antral follicles, right? So those are the follicles that have the antral cavity and we can see them in the ultrasound. So it's easy to stage and to measure the size and, and, and you know, by doing follicular dynamics, figure out when they're going to ovulate and so on. Um, the other part of the equation is the pre follicles. So they, they are called pre follicles because they don't have an antral cavity. So all they are is the early stages of follicles that will grow, hopefully, and become an antral follicle to grow during every astrocycle. So when we think about the astrocycle and the follicles growing and becoming dominant or undergoing atresia, there is always a waves of pre follicles coming up from those primordial follicles that form the ovarian reserve of the cow or of the female, that will hopefully give us a, a cohort of antral follicles for us to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, astrosynchronization on or whatever. So the pre follicogenesis is really important for us to make sure we have antral follicles growing in every astrocycle. So we have pre antral and antral follicogenesis basically. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Perfect. Okay, so that lays the groundwork. So the next question is, within the work that you do, what new techniques have you been developing or employing in your studies? And sort of alongside that, what challenges and environmental factors might be affecting livestock that are tied to those new techniques? So to study pre follicles, we have to um, employ different techniques, right? So we can't really see them in the ultrasound when you ultrasound the cow. So if you want to take pre follicles out of an animal, live animal, you have to uh, do what we have been doing here in my lab, which is ovarian biopsies. So uh, when you do ovarian um, uh, OPU, for example, ovum pickup, sometimes you can find some of those follicles because the, the, the ovary, the way it's organized, the cortex or the outside of the ovary in the cow, for example, has most of the follicles, right? So when you're aspirating follicles, sometimes you go through the, the stroma of the ovary and you pick up those small follicles. But that's uh, 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 something you find sporadically, right? So to get those follicles, you really need to go and take a piece of the tissue. And so that's what we call ovarian biopsy or biopsy pickup. Uh, very similar to ovum pickup, but taking pieces of the stroma of the cortex and not really going at the antral follicles. So that's one thing that we do in vivo. And in vitro, we have developed or improved protocols that already existed for cows and other uh, species where you go through a series of uh, homogenization and, and, and uh, cutting the, the, the stroma of the cortex and then filtering and then going through the microscope to find those pre follicles. They're very, very small. Um, 
and much more fragile and much more delicate to to handle. So uh, we do a lot of work here looking at ways to better culture those follicles. Uh, One of the big uh, goals here is to uh, use those preantral follicles as a source for assisted reproduction. So instead of when we look at hosting cows, for example, at, at aspirating, let's say, eight to ten antral follicles for OPU, you could be taking an ovarian biopsy and getting hundreds of follicles, free antral follicles, because there's more of those. But you need a way to grow them in the lab. And so that's one of the things that we do. And alongside that, we do uh, look at environmental factors. And a big one that we have looked at over the years is heat stress, because we know the effects of heat stress can be really catastrophic to reproduction. And so we have done studies looking at uh, how pre follicles respond to heat stress in vitro. So just taking those follicles out of a slaughterhouse ovary, culturing them under, you know, 41, 42 degrees versus not. One study that we did I thought was really interesting um, was we, we wanted to do intermittent heat stress for one week. So trying to mimic what a cow goes through in a hot week during the summer. So here in California, we have a very high, typically high amplitude of temperature. So during the day, we, we reach, you know, very hot days, 110, and then it will go down to much lower than that, right? 70 degrees sometimes at night. So they do get that, that, that rest from the heat. And so this is what we did. We did eight hours of heat stress for the follicles and then 16 hours of normal temperature. Tomorrow, we put them again at heat stress for seven days. And so we saw that the, fol- the pre antral follicles were affected, so growth was different. The follicles that were not exposed to heat stress grew better and were more viable in the end of the one week than the pre antral follicles that were exposed to intermittent heat stress. So I think that that's really interesting because uh, it shows, it gives us some evidence of why it takes so long for the cows to return to a fertile state after summer, right? Because if we were to explain that just by the antral follicles, in one or two cycles or 20 or 40 days, it will be fine, but it takes a lot of, sometimes longer than that. And so that's to us explaining the pre follicles are also being affected, right? And that's why it takes longer. Yeah, that's, it. that's really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to ask this next question under the assumption that there are no dumb questions because <laughs> I don't know much about this area. But we, we constantly hear about the THI index, the temperature humidity index. In that work that you just described, does the heat stress component, uh, I guess, take into it must take into account the THI, the humidity piece, just holistically, or is there fluctuations within how you adjust the temperature based off of what we would, what I have been taught in terms of the humidity component of that? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Uh, and it's it's a tricky one actually because when we do in vitro studies, um, it's harder to control the humidity portion, right? And so we just we just work with um, uh, 99% humidity, which is what the incubator gives us. We put that water pan in the bottom. So that's what that's constant humidity. And we're just cha- changing the temperature, right? So that will change the THI. Um, I never calculated that, to be honest, in vitro. When we did in vivo studies, uh, for example, another uh, interesting part of our work here is the looking at effects of uh, the sleek mutation. So um, taking a naturally occurring mutation in cattle, which is the sleek mutation, which really is a, a mutation in the prolactin receptor uh, gene that makes these animals uh, more heat tolerant. And so when we do those studies in vivo, then we calculate the HI. We always measure temperature and humidity because we know in the environment those will vary bit, uh, along the day. And so all of our studies are based on, based on the HI and not just on temperature and humidity. So, so then for sure, because we know that that has an important effect and we have seen that actually, that difference. Okay. So then let's expand on the slick mutation a little bit. So you, you work within that space. We have genetic opportunity to manage heat stress through those animals. So in the work that you do then, I guess, can you speak to how that slick mutation, the slick gene ultimately can be incorporated into the the various types of trials or, you know, field work versus lab work that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I was always interested in the slick gene because I, I did my PhD work with Pete Hansen at the University of Florida, and he's been studying the slick mutation for, for a long time. And so that was always very interesting because uh, we know heat stress is, is, is a factor, right? That affects uh, fertility, affects reproduction, and therefore production of, of livestock. Um, and so 
I think that so in vivo, we have been able to study a lot more because there is not a large population of sleek hostings out there. And so to study uh, um, things uh, like reproduction is hard because you really need a lot of it. If you want to see if they became pregnant or not based on having the sleek mutation, you need hundreds of animals, right? Really, that's that's a reality. So we tend to study, you know, response to heat stress, uh, how their temperature, the body temperature changed, how their skin temperature changed, if they, did they sweat more or not, uh, lactation parameters. So we try to look at those things um, more. And to be honest, we have not done uh, in vitro studies using, well, we have, but not fertility related. We have looked at the skin of uh, sleek animals versus uh, non-sleek animals. So we, we have done different types of studies with them. Uh, and really the goal is to uh, better understand what the mutation really is doing because we know that they become more heat tolerant. They have shorter hair. They they respond better. They 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 can withstand the heat a little more than uh, non slick hostings. And the interesting fact that I think plays a big role going back to the THI is that humidity really uh, seems to play a role there because the, the when the THI can be similar, but if the factor taking that THI high or up or a lot higher is humidity, it seems to, the, the sleek animals seem to do better than non-sleek when humidity is very high versus when humidity is not very high. So that's a really interesting um, uh, fact that we have seen in our studies. We did a big study comparing sleek animals in California versus Florida, and, that, and the humidity is drastically different between these two places, even though they're very hot, both are very hot. Uh, and we saw differences between how the sleek responded compared to non-sleek half sisters in Florida and in California. So that's kind of going on the side. I was not really talking about reproduction, but um, I think that we still have a lot to study to to see if this tolerance to heat uh, that the sleek animals can 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 develop or have naturally uh, translates into better fertility during the summer months. Yeah, that's awesome. That's I, I would love to do that study, but it's a, difficult at the time. Yeah, no, that's fair. So I think this is a great place to wrap up this conversation, um, but it also sort of sets the stage for future conversations as stuff <laughs> comes down the pipeline. So thank you so much for spending some time with us. Really appreciate it. This is super insightful and we'll look forward to following your research as you move forward. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure.